All right, guys, UFC 281 is finished. I'm going to tell you why this card pissed me off so much. I'm also going to acknowledge that I completely bombed on predictions. I did terrible on predictions. My first, I guess, video back on YouTube after the, uh, the strikes and everything, I thought, you know, hey, no one's picking Chandler. No one's picking Adesanya. This is going to be a great card for me. And it just completely went on its face. We're going to get into that. Um, I also want to talk about what's next for some of the fighters. Let's start off with the Hooker versus Puelas fight. I thought Puelas was going to be able to show that he is levels above when it comes to the grappling and he's going to be able to get Dan Hooker down. And if he was able to get Hooker down, I thought he was going to be able to get the sub. And I give huge respect to Dan Hooker for staying in there, being very patient, even when Puelas got aggressive and he went for the takedown, like I said he was going to do, put him in those situations. He almost wrapped up a leg very close to being uh, in a very dangerous spot for Dan Hooker. And Dan Hooker just had the patience of a saint and waited and waited and just knew when the moment was to get out of it finish the fight, hats off to Dan Hooker, he really did his job, he's uh, hopefully, you know, on this sort of comeback trail, you know, because he's had a rough time as of late, right, he's had a very up and down career, so hopefully he builds some momentum and he's able to get a streak off of this fight. Moving on, we have Frankie Edgar versus Chris Gutierrez, again, I thought Frankie Edgar was going to be able to utilize grappling in this fight. I thought he was going to be able to wear on Gutierrez. However, Gutierrez, explosive individual. We all know that Frankie Edgar is very susceptible to the knee in the center channel. He is not as quick. He is not as fluid as he once was in his younger years. Got caught with it. And a very sad situation for Frankie Edgar because... Um, he's been, you know, not doing well, right? And he's taken a lot of damage late in his career, which is one of the worst things you can have. But also, you know, he is literally right across the Hudson River from his hometown in Jersey. And I'm also from Jersey. So it was it was hard to see this because really Frankie Edgar, you know, when you thought of MMA and you thought of New Jersey, you only thought of one name. Like he was the guy that had New Jersey on the map, you know, that everyone thought of as like, wow, like, you know, Jersey has some really good wrestlers. Jersey has some really good competitors. He should not have been fighting, in, in my opinion. He should not have been fighting this younger guy who is, you know, on the come up of his career. That would have made things way more entertaining. The fight would have probably been three rounds. If he lost the decision, he would probably go out on that and be like, you know, listen, I gave this sport everything. But to get knocked out in brutal fashion, you know, three miles away from like your state and then your children are in attendance. It's very, very tough thing to see. But I honestly, I want to commend Frankie for, you know, all the years that he put in, I mean, and being able to be champion at lightweight. I mean, look at that division now, look at the lightweight division now and just realize something five, six Frankie Edgar was able to become champion at the division. Obviously, MMA was a different sport at the time. There weren't as many weight bullies in the sport as of now. You have guys like Jalen Turner, you know, at lightweight now, or whatever weight class he's at. I mean, you have, like, th these huge weight bullies that should not be fighting at their weight classes, but somehow they're able to dehydrate themselves enough just to get down to that weight class. And then on that day, they're walking around, like, 15, 20 pounds heavier than what they weighed in at. It's, it's just so stupid. It's like such a game and it gets everybody into this like false notion of like who's great and who's not. But this is a man who really fought it at his weight class in his prime and became the best and won it all and did everything that he had to do in the sport. So I want to go ahead and give a huge show of support to Frankie, the answer Edgar and thank him for giving us and blessing us uh, with the performances, obviously the Gray Maynard performance, um, he's had, you know, that, that win over Chad Mendez was huge. I mean, he's had just a great career, so I commend him, wish him well, hopefully he enjoys retirement. If he changes his mind last minute and he gets a fight or he wants to fight again, let it be an old guy, let it be an old uh, veteran who's coming out of the sport or he's, you know, towards the tail end of his career. 
don't let it be an up and comer like that. Moving on up the card, we have Dustin Poirier versus Michael Chandler. I predicted Michael Chandler was going to get the win. I thought he was going to wrestle. Guess what? He wrestled, right? I said exactly what was going to happen. However, Michael Chandler shows that he has not learned a lesson from any of the past fights that he's ever fought in the UFC, okay? This guy literally only wants to entertain the crowd. He doesn't care. Dominantly won that second round, okay? He has all the intangibles. This is a guy that literally has all of the intangibles. It's just mentally, he slips up. He's mentally like, it's like a switch goes off where if the crowd is not cheering enough, or if the crowd is not going crazy enough, he has to go out there and he has to trade hands and he has to trade all of these things. You know, that's insane. He should not be doing that. And it shows, like I said, he has not learned and he has not come to that point in his career where he is taking that serious. He's really relying on his chin a lot more. He's relying on, you know, people hitting his shoulders and not really focused on defense when it comes to striking. He's really only focused on going forward and entertaining the crowd. And like I said, he was going to come out. He was going to hurt Dustin. You know, he was going to throw big shots early, get Dustin to shell up against the cage, take him down. And I knew he was going to be able to take him down and just work him from there, like ground and pound, all of those things. If Michael Chandler just fought a smarter fight, he easily could have won a decision. And this is why this card pissed me off. It was the Frankie Edgar KO. He shouldn't have been fighting a young up-and-comer. Should have been fighting an older veteran. And now he had to get knocked out in front of his kids. You know, that pisses me off. Then you have a guy like Michael Chandler who, again, I was thinking that was going to win. And he was pretty much on his way to win that fight if, let's say, the third round, you know, Dustin does not finesse that position. And, you know, Michael Chandler is on top for another minute and 30 seconds. That fight could easily go as a decision to Michael Chandler. It's just Michael Chandler lost that fight. He just needed to be smart and he needed to be efficacious with his striking when it came to be that way. And he just needed to utilize grappling and really clock control. That's really what it came down to. And Michael Chandler just gave it all up because, you know, the crowd wasn't cheering enough or the crowd wasn't as entertained. All his game plan and his strategy that he worked on for weeks with Henry Hoof, that goes out the window. Now it's time for, you know, Michael, you know, the entertainer Chandler to come out and just lose the fight. That's essentially what just happened. But, you know, that pissed me off as well because I want to see Michael Chandler get a win. And, you know, he's supposedly this big time free agent that the UFC signed. And you look at his record in the UFC and it's really not stacking up for probably what they're paying for him. And, you know, if he loses another fight, they're going to cut him, right? Like, this is not, this is not cool. So hopefully Michael Chandler learns the lesson after this fight. I mean, this has to be the final line where he learns his lesson and, you know, stops trying to be an entertainer in there. And he really just focuses on becoming the smarter, better fighter. And over time, I think he will. I think he'll come back to the drawing board and uh, he'll really circle back and probably learn his lesson. As for Dustin Poirier, the guy has grit. He's tough. They don't call him the diamond for no reason, okay? This guy is quality. He is a quality talent. Make no mistake, everything he does is, you know, pristine. Everything he does in there is pristine, okay? Yes, the takedown defense lacks at times, especially against good wrestlers, but, you know, this guy is solid on the feet, solid with cardio, um, technique is on point, great Brazilian jiu-jitsu, good head movement, good boxing. This guy is really there like he is really there outside of Oliveira he is really in that top three category right now like at lightweight he's there you can't talk about lightweight without talking about Dustin Poirier so good win for him he's gonna rise up in the division and he'll always be there he's always gonna be a tough fight for everyone moving on to the co-main event Carla Esparza versus Zhang Wei Li I knew Zhang Wei Li was gonna have the you know, ability to get this done. I just didn't think it was going to be by submission. I thought it was going to be by TKO, but hats off to her. She really did what she came here to do. She did her business. Um, she's going to be a very hard female to be in that division. She is, I think, going to get to that new level in her career where she's more mature. The nerves are not as bad as they once were. You know, she's better when it comes to footwork. 
better wrestling game completely. I mean, her grappling game has like reached a very good level and she's able to use that in her fights now. And I think that's going to dictate a lot of her fights coming up as well. So hats off to her. Congratulations. She becomes the champ again in that division. Moving on to the main event. I said Israel Adesanya was going to win this fight. Now, I'm giving Israel Adesanya the benefit of the doubt because of his skills in the octagon, okay? He is quicker. He is fast. I believe he does have the better footwork. I believe he, you know, has probably the better head movement and defensive ability when it comes to striking. Everybody is comparing this Israel Adesanya and Pereira to Edwards and Usman. And I can see how they're drawing that parallel, but at the end of the day, it's not very much the same in that sense because there obviously were some nuances. But like, again, I can see how you're getting to that point. It wasn't like a dominating performance by Israel the entire time. And then all of a sudden Pereira just snuck it out at the last second, like in the way that Edwards did. This was a back and forth a very competitive fight and you know no one is going to argue that so th this was very competitive and I knew it was going to be either one or two ways okay and I just didn't expect the finish to come in the later rounds by Pereira I thought it was going to come by Adesanya if it went to the later rounds but what did I say in the prediction video I said if Pereira starts targeting the body and he starts going to the body early on Adesanya Adesanya is going to have a rough night and what happened? He had a rough night dealing with that. Okay, that power is serious. The knees to the body, the body shots overall, like just the left hook to the body, the body kicks, the high kicks even snuck up on Adesanya. This is a guy who brings so many dimensions to the striking game, the way that Adesanya brings so many dimensions. So it's literally like, you know, someone who has a katana and someone who has a machete and they're duking it out, right? What's the best pro for the for the katana? The katana, it's thin, it's very sharp, but it's faster. What's the uh, pros to the machete? It's also sharp, but it has more of a denseness to it where it can get through things at a better level, right? It can chop down things at a um, higher level, right? And it's literally like you're seeing those two things play out, right? Like you're seeing Pereira with the uh, brute force element to him. And then you're seeing, you know, uh, Adesanya with the speed and the quickness. And you're really seeing these two merge it out. And, uh, you know, it, it pissed me off because it's like Adesanya, that first round, Adesanya puts the combo on him. And Pereira is out on his feet. Like, this guy is pretty much done. If that bell is not there and Adesanya is going to follow up, it's Adesanya's fight. And he remains champion and he wins in dominant fashion. It just turns out... It happened too late. And over time, you saw that everything that Pereira was doing in those middle rounds, so first, second, third, um, started to creep up, right? Like you started seeing the wearing on Adesanya. You also saw Adesanya frustrate Pereira in a lot of ways. So it really just, it needed to be solidified in the later rounds, right? You have to ramp up the pressure in those later rounds. Adesanya was taking his foot off the gas pedal a little bit. He was allowing Pereira to dictate space a little bit more. He was not throwing any kicks. I mean, Adesanya was just, didn't throw any front kicks, did not throw any teeps at all. I don't know why he didn't do that because Pereira was getting very close to him in a lot of ways that no one else in the division was able to get that close. He had the confidence going forward that he can get that close to Adesanya and Adesanya wasn't going to do anything about it. He just didn't respect him in those later rounds. And if Adesanya would have thrown a couple of teeps, a couple of front kicks, thrown some jabs, really made Pereira pay for taking that space, I think Pereira would have thought twice, but he didn't. And Adesanya looked tired and Pereira looked tired. And it really came down to who wants this more Who's going to bite down on their mouthpiece and make the sacrifice here? Because at the end of the day, Pereira was thinking it to his self, you know, only one person has the power to finish it in that moment. And realistically, it was Pereira at that moment because Adesanya was landing very flush in those middle rounds at times. 
and he was not able to put down Pereira. The real commendment for Pereira was the chin holding up. Like, I, it's unbelievable how he was really almost out in that first round, and then he survived the middle rounds, and then at the end of the fight, came back and beat Adesanya the same way that he was about to go out in the first round. It's very, very cool to see that be the case, you know? And, um, you know, it's tough. You know, it's a tough thing, right? Israel Adesanya, I thought he was doing very well in the fight. Like, I really thought we were going to see an Adesanya cruise to a decision. Pereira comes out there and he just capitalizes and he just bites down on the mouthpiece. And he's like, I want it more than you. I'm going to take it. Watch me do it. Boom, left hook cracks him. Adesanya is on wobbly legs, falls down. Is it an early stoppage? Let's talk about that. In my opinion, I do believe it was slightly early. I think you give Adesanya maybe like five more seconds to get out of that situation. The non-casual fans probably understand that that fight would have been ended. Okay, that fight would have ended where Adesanya either fell on his face or got knocked cold out against the cage, it would have it would have ended in a bad way. So the ref stepping in in that moment was actually a pretty good thing to save Adesanya's career and also, also allow for the rematch to take place. Because if Adesanya would have just got knocked out clean like that in that late round, then the rematch doesn't sound as appealing, right? But the fact that he didn't and he stood upright and he was trying to fight back or trying to evade the strikes and try to answer back, that actually gives more room for the rematch to happen. So likely, we will see the rematch. We're going to see the rematch between Adesanya and Pereira. As for that, Pereira, congratulations. He came in, he had like very few fights and just got to the belt. Um, in fact, he made Bruno Silva look very good, okay? This fight actually, like the way it played out, it really made Bruno Silva look very good from his performance against Pereira. So just have to say that. On top of that, after the fight, Kamzat Shamayev is on Twitter saying that he wants to fight Alex Pereira and saying, let's go, Dana White, make this fight. For all of the people who are pushing this Colby fight, I'm telling you, Kamzat is going to stay at middleweight. I don't believe that he's going back down to welterweight to fight Colby. I think he really needs to settle at middleweight, okay? I don't think that, you know, him going back and forth between divisions like this is a good idea anyway. He's 6'2". He has the wrestling to really dominate in this fight. I mean, just imagine a Kamzat Shamayev at his body weight, probably naturally, or maybe he bulks up to 195 and then cuts down, whatever he has to do. But just imagine a 185 Kamzat Shamayev going ahead and fighting a 185 Alex Pereira. That's a fair fight, in my opinion, because Kamzai has the grappling to go toe-to-toe, -to, -toe, to get it into a grappling exchange and really make Pereira, you know, scared. These are the two forces of the MMA world right now. You have the pinnacle scary person when it comes to striking in Pereira and also power, then you also have the very scary person when it comes to grappling and the most dominant person in grappling probably right now in the sport, and that's Kamzat. So it's very, very interesting. I like that matchup for Kamzat and Pereira versus Kamzat versus Colby because there is a very good chance that Kamzat does not make weight or he makes weight and then he it, the fight does not go the way that he thinks it's going to go because I don't think Colby is going to be an easy task for him. Um, especially at 170 if he has to dehydrate his body that way. Because look at what Gilbert Burns did to him. Look at what Gilbert Burns did to him. And if you think that Colby is not going to have the cardio to do that to him in those later rounds, I think Colby can survive, and I think Colby can really put it on him in the later rounds. I'm not saying he's going to finish him, but I think, you know, Kamzat is really in for trouble if he's going the 170 route because he has to fight the scale and he has to fight the opponents. Whereas 185, he just has to make weight and his skills will do the talking. Kamzat Shamayev can really run through the middleweight division. I really believe that. If he just went to that division, that's all he has to do. So I am for Kamzat versus Pereira after the Israel Adesanya rematch. Obviously, Glover 
is going to be fighting Prohaska next. So we'll see what happens. We'll see how all this plays out. I'm very excited to see what happens uh, with the new champ and what type of matchups they're going to make. Obviously, they're just going to probably go for the rematch, but it would be interesting if Kamzat is saying like, hey, I can do a quick turnaround and I'll fight this guy. That would be pretty cool to see. So we just have to see how it plays out. But anyway, let me know what you guys thought about UFC 281 down in the comment section. Also, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. I upload every week on combat sports, current events, news commentary, and go ahead and leave a like. It really helps the channel out a lot. Thank you guys for watching. I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.